Okay, uh, for those who have been uh, traveling with us through Hebrews, or are coming to a portion uh, in Hebrews, uh, chapter 13, that uh, is a, uh, it may seem a little bit different, but it fits into the very theme of Hebrews. It has to do with who Yeshua is and what he has done, because he is Adonai, because he is the Lord uh, God, came in the flesh, therefore the very salvation he brought about is an eternal salvation, uh, and for that we have to give him praise. Uh, so I'd like you to uh, stand with me, if you would, uh, to read the scripture together, if you're able to. Don't feel forced to, though. Bit of a rough week, we understand. Let's read the whole thing in unison, uh, following the reading. Uh, we'll have a moment of, of prayer, asking God to help us to understand and apply it. Let's read together. Through Yeshua, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, that is, the fruit of lips confessing his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Indeed, Father, we pray that through Yeshua we would have the very key for living the, the abundant life, the victorious life, a life that is pleasing to you and honoring to your name, uh, that the name of our God and Savior would be exalted in our lives, in our community, in our families, uh, and that it would be because of the work that you have done uh, as we appreciate it, as we grow into it, and as we live it out. So add your blessing, we pray, to, to our study and its application in Messiah's name. Amen. Please be seated. Indeed, this portion continues the theme that through Yeshua, uh, we have the key for living the stronger messianic life uh, in him, uh, and we want to move on in that life. These verses are meant to teach us how to live in a whole new paradigm, in a whole new way of living, uh, because we've taken, a, we, uh, we've, we've kind of traipsed our way out of the camp last week, and we saw that uh, we went out to him, uh, but in doing so, we are in a different place. Uh, we don't have uh, the skills and the wisdom. All the wisdom, and it's hard to understand this, all the wisdom we have gained is wisdom of this world and how to live uh, even victoriously in the camp, not outside the camp. Uh, and maybe the wisdom of the dark is where you do your best business. Uh, but God has a different way of life, of how to live differently. Uh, these believers uh, were being uh, pressured uh, and persecuted by uh, the community they were in to give up fervent faith in Yeshua and rather to go back to more traditional religion. But the teaching has been, no, the way to enjoy victory is to go outside the camp. Not to have one foot in the camp and one foot elsewhere, no. Go outside the camp to the Messiah and learn a different way to live, a different lifestyle with different values, uh, different ways of, of understanding how to evaluate life or what is good and what is bad. A whole new paradigm uh, for our lives to be living uh, as we understand the new life. Uh, the grace uh, through faith that brings us uh, to him outside the camp is actually what we live by outside the camp. Uh, through him, uh, the scripture is going to reiterate to our minds and our hearts, through Yeshua, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. So that faith is what brings us into that grace. So we want to understand the importance of this matter. Uh, the bondage uh, of sin is reflected in the bondage to worldly values, bondage to personal nasty habits, per bondage to emotional issues that may keep us from living for God. Uh, some of us are so conditioned by the negative things of this world that we're able to be distracted and disoriented so quickly. We're able to be removed from our focus of running the race set before us looking unto Yeshua. And so as we grow stronger in the messianic life, we grow stronger by looking to Yeshua and that through him enjoying that grace of God through faith uh, outside the camp. That's a life of grace. 
everything outside the camp, where he is, he's not only outside the box, he is outside the camp. He is not part of the value system of this world. The value system of this world is based upon a lie. It's based upon rebellion uh, to who he is, to his holiness and to his love, to his kindness. And so we want to understand the victorious life that he has for us. It's a life that we have in the Messiah, uh, in light of who he is. The grace life that we enjoy uh, is through Messiah. And all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Yeshua. Uh, not apart from him, but through him. Uh, the very one who loved us and loved us unto the end. And so this victorious life, as, as I've noted for you there, uh, this victorious life is the life outside the camp. It's a life of grace through faith in the Messiah, and it's going to be seen in two aspects. You, know, it's not, you don't get to choose which one. Uh, some of you may be, uh, you know, you may like one over the other. Well, lovely. Uh, but both are two sides of the same coin of grace. And so as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, as we grow uh, in the fullness of his grace, as we grow uh, into the likeness of the Messiah, we're going to be growing in these two areas. This is what life is like outside the camp. Uh, gratitude towards God and graciousness towards others these are what these two verses, you say, well, I don't quite understand how those two things are what life could be about. Well, let me go over it a little more deeply. As we consider uh, my own heart, uh, back quite a number of years ago, I realized uh, that the problem of my life was not my circumstances. A change of circumstances was not the hope of my life. It was my heart. My heart was hardened out of selfishness and all sorts of other things. Uh, but by uh, the grace of God, through faith in Yeshua, God made a difference and gave me a new heart. Uh, not me alone, all who come to faith in Yeshua. Uh, and this new life and this new heart is lived out by that very same grace of God. It's a free gift he gives to all who will believe and trust in him, his goodness, his promises, and all he has for us in the Messiah of Israel. And now as we live that life by faith, faith lives out that grace of God in these two areas. Faithfully grateful to God, faithfully gracious to others. We'll take a look at those two verses, uh, but let's understand the bigger picture if we might. Uh, these Hebrews who this letter was written to, uh, they were basically feeling tormented, tra uh, just pressured, persecuted, uh, and maybe you're feeling that way, not because someone is trying to uh, overtly try to get you to stop believing in Yeshua, though that may be the case. It may be the financial issues you're going through. It may be the emotional problems you're struggling with. It may be family issues. It may be relationship problems. Uh, maybe health issues that you can't get a handle on. You don't understand why God has allowed these problems to happen. Or even as Eden so eloquently shared when she you know, left the, the, the luxury of the United States and went into a world where people were just thankful to have a chicken coop to live in, a chicken house. She said, how could God allow such things? And she realized, no, she's got to do something about it. Well, you may be in the same situation. You may, well, how can God allow these problems? How can God allow you know, what takes place in Boston? Uh, for such evil to be perpetrated. How could God allow what took place in West Texas? How many remember what took place this week in West Texas? Raise your hand. And how can our hearts not go out to those people and care about them and reach out to them? How can God, you may be in that same struggle for your life, just like the Hebrews were. And you may be thinking, I'm going to have to take, go back to plan B. Plan A of trusting God doesn't seem to help because, I don't know, God does some funny things in this world, and I don't know if I can trust him with my finances. I don't know if I can trust him with my health, with family members, with all the issues of life. I don't know. I don't know about that, so I'm going to have to go back to plan B. Be selfish, be mean, be miserable, be complainy. All those plan Bs that we have, you know, right there on the shelf, ready to take off when things don't go perfectly the way we want in God's name. 
Uh, but this is actually the problem the Hebrews were going to face. They'll reinforce their issues unless they realize that they have to walk by faith. The problems are not going to be resolved by plan B. There is no plan B with God. There's only plan A. God's plan is his grace through faith in the Messiah. There is no other way for us to live outside the camp. And therefore, the whole of Scripture speaks of these two elements. Uh, the first tablet of the law uh, had to do with loving God. Yeshua was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he came up with one that wasn't the, on the top ten list, uh, but one of the, the Vahafta. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. And he said, second unto that, love your neighbor as yourself. And so this is what all of the scripture speaks of, that love is seen in a gratitude towards God and graciousness towards others. As we love God, we appreciate what he's done. But the enemy of your souls wants to distract you from that, wants you to keep you. It seems like, well, I'm just not in the mood to be praising God. Who asked what kind of mood you're in? How self-indulgent of you. You got to be in the right mood. I have to be approached in the right sort of way. Well, la-di-da. Uh, gird up the loins of your mind. It's a real warfare. You haven't got time to play the immature card. You got to step up and step out with the Lord. Outside the camp is a life of grace through faith. Where you have to say, no, I'm going to praise God. Love the song songs for today. I will sing unto the Lord. The enemy wants you to basically be given over to discouragement, depression, and despair. And I say, don't go there. Not at all. Trust God. What will that matter? Because he is going to lead you by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Trust God. Gird, on, gird up the loins of your mind and praise God trusting him for the blessings that are his that come by faith. And therefore, in the midst of battle, and you're fighting a battle, it's a battle within your soul, in your own heart, in that battleground of your soul, you need to have a stewardship response to God and his word and trust him and praise God for who he is and for what he has done once and for all and forever. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore the victory that was true yesterday is true today and will be true forever unless you've gotten your eyes off what is the truth. Because it's the truth that will set you free, not your emotions and feelings or, or stinking thinking that you indulge yourself in when things don't go the way you'd like it to go. That is a life of unbelief. It's a life that's going to undermine your soul. You have to press to the mark of a high calling. And we press on that together as we see. And so we want to understand this matter uh, for our lives. And just quickly, just to reiterate, before we move along, two simple points in this portion. Be a God praiser. Uh, that's what, you know, Yehuda, a praiser of God, Judah. Uh, and so Jew reminds us, you know, king of the Jews, remember the praise. And if you're saying, well, I, I, I am a Jew, well, then you should be doubly thankful that they took the first part of the word Judah and not the last part, otherwise you'd be called a duh. And so, if for nothing else, you can praise him for that. Uh, you say, well, what if I'm not Jewish? You can praise him for the many blessings that come, the same blessings by faith. Uh, we all have the same blessings. We're all equal in his sight, uh, by the way. And so our grateful sacrifice. The sacrifices of grace are going to be seen in you giving praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Our worship of him. And so, also in verse 16, be a God-pleaser. You say, well, I, I'm working my way up to, I'm a people pleaser now. Oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> no, no, we're not people. We're people persons. We're reaching out to people. We're not people pleasers. Be a God pleaser. Uh, please him uh, with all of your life. This is what we're called to do. Uh, you say, well, I'm just not into it. You are just immature, and you're going to reinforce the problem if you stay there. Move on. Trust God in the midst of it all. Press to that mark and, and live. You know, act like a man. You, know, you say, but I'm a woman. Okay, act like a woman then. But, but uh, then woman up uh, to the calling we share together. We're going to look at our worship of Adonai, but our walk with him as well. Now as we move right into the text. 
It says there, as we saw through Yeshua, therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Through Yeshua. Uh, there's no other way to come to the Father but by Him. Uh, he is the one who actually is the, is the door uh, that we come into the very presence of God. And so we want to remember that all the sacrifices that we make are commemorative. They're memorial in nature. They all are reminders of what he, who he is and what he has done for us. For he has made the full and complete sacrifice we saw last week uh, for our sins and all other things. And our praise offerings, therefore, are merely reminders, reflective, memorial uh, to his sacrifice. Just like they'll be in the kingdom for those who study on these matters. There'll be sacrifices, but all of them are merely memorial. Just as all the sacrifices before the Messiah came were anticipatory. They all anticipated the full sacrifice he would make. Afterwards, all a memorial, commemorative uh, to his grace. And so we want to understand when you praise God and you give him a grateful praise, oh, thank you, Lord, you know, to the El, thank you, God. Thank you so much for saving me. Thank you for, for salvation. Thank you for your all-sufficient grace for my life. That is your faith receipt. Faith, you see, that is the substance of things hoped for. That is exactly the receipt that on, on the truth that you have trusted in the grace of God, that you have received his gift in your life. Uh, so that's something you want to be bringing to the Lord. All sacrifices, of course, a memorial. We give him praise. Uh, for that once and for all sacrifice, even as it says, this is how we draw near to God. Therefore, he is able to also save forever. Uh, out loud, say the word save forever. save forever. Do you believe that you are saved forever? Yes. How can you not thank him forever? My goodness, imagine believing that and that not impacting you. How hardened have you become? How jaded have you become? Uh, that you've allowed your heart to be indifferent to such a glorious truth to save forever those who draw near to God through Yeshua. It's always through him. No man cometh to the Father but by me, he said, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And so through Yeshua, we're able to enjoy this eternal salvation coming into the very presence of God. How can we not praise him for that? And so when it talks about the sacrifice of praise in this verse there, I want to just mention that when uh, they, the rabbis were translating the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, they're called the Septuagint. Most of the world at that time was speaking Greek, and so uh, that would have a lot more uh, readership, uh, you see. And when they translated into Greek, they took the, when it said there about the, the thanks offering, the todah offering, uh, todah zavak, uh, the todah offering, uh, they take that phrase, thanks offering, and they made it this phrase in the original language, sacrifice of praise. And so when it says here, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, this has to do with the thanks offering, part of the peace offerings. You say a peace offering... Uh, what in the world is this about? Well, we'll understand that we looked last week at the sin offering Messiah made for us. Following the sin offering, when you, you say, why would I want a sin offering? Because your sins that no longer have you blushing still offend God. Whether you blush or not, they're still as sinful as they ever were. And so the sin offering was made in order that we might have a right relationship with God. And once the sin offering was made, then they would have a peace offering because they were at peace with God. And that would be by way of thanksgivings, as you see from Leviticus chapter 7, verse 13. Because we enjoy fellowship with God and each other. If you have trusted in the Messiah, in his sacrifice for your sins, you also have him as your peace offering. He is our peace. He has made the two one, not only God and humanity, but Jew and Gentile, one in him. And therefore, we offer to him the sacrifice of praise that shows that we have trusted in the sin offering. Listen, if you have trusted in the sin offering, the next step for the worshiper was the peace offering. You say, well, 
Uh, what if I just go to the peace offering? You couldn't get there unless you do the sin offering. The sin offering brought you to the peace offering. And so gratitude to God. That reveals your dependence on God's grace. It's a contribution of faith. I want you to notice the text there. Offer to God. Do you see it says offer to God? Uh, in other words, God does not take it from you. Just like a husband and wife. You say, what? Yes. It says if you're going to have a good relationship with God, have your prayers answered, husbands. It says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, you are to grant her honor. You say, well, what's she done to deserve it? No, you see, you're back into that mode again. No, no, the fact that she puts up with you, she deserves above and beyond. And you know, the Medal of Honor. Of, uh, no, you grant her honor so your prayers will be answered. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You're granting honor. She doesn't have to take it. She doesn't have to manipulate you. She doesn't have to go, you know, fishing for compliments and all of the rest of the stuff just to know whether or not you care about her. You say, well, uh, well what's that got to do with God? Same thing. We offer him a sacrifice of praise. He doesn't take it. He's not trying to manipulate us. We don't go into this deal saying, well, what have you done lately? I know you died for sins. Well, that was good, but that was yesterday's news, babe. What about today? And so we want to understand that eternal sacrifice, the blessings we have, we offer to him. You say, why would I do that? Because it shows that you're depending upon him. It shows you're depending upon his sacrifice. It shows you're depending upon the grace of God. Gratitude, English is nice this way. Uh, the word gratitude comes from our English word grace. You see, grace produces gratitude if you're trusting in the grace of God. And therefore, we continually do it. You say, continually? It should be habit forming. Be thankful in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Messiah Yeshua, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Be thankful in all things, for this is God's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. In all things, I'm to be thankful. We shouldn't we wait to see how it turns out? It'll turn, I read the end of the book, you win. It's going to be great. Give him praise now. Thank him now. The fact that he'll never leave you or forsake you through it all. Thank him now. Thank him for the many blessings he has for you as you trust him and follow him. And so we want to understand uh, this praise, this continual praise that we have for God. It's like breathing. It's true all the time because the, the salvation is true all the time. And when, anytime you're going through, this is a way for you to grow. I want you to sort of make a little checklist for yourself as you're growing in the Lord. Those moments in the day with those individuals you're around, you know who they are. It could be when you have to give a report to the boss or when you have to kind of diaper that baby. Six months old, can't even diaper himself. Man, I hope that kid's going to appreciate me for the rest of his life. <laughs> no, no, no. He'll never, no, 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 no. no. Uh, just like you're not appreciating your mother for what she did for you, by the way. But in any case, fact of the matter is, that no, 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 uh, you're going to, during those situations that, you know, you say, I don't really like diaper, I don't like doing dishes, I don't like this, I don't like that. During those times, you can just say, huh, I'm not trusting in his grace right now. I've gone over into whining and complaining. That must be a gift of the Spirit, right? No, no. You are taking your eyes off the ball. Eyes off the mark, you're not looking unto Yeshua. You're actually going back into yourself about how you like things in life. This is God's will for you to be thankful to him in all things. And so we grow in this area. This is part of the maturing. You can test and sort of evaluate your own maturity. How much during your day is given over to praise and how much is just kind of being a sourpuss. You say, well, it's only like I got five whole minutes of praise this day. You're growing. That's great. We didn't think you'd ever get to five minutes. You're doing wonderful. Keep going. Keep going, though. Uh, we want to stop, uh, stop trusting in ourselves. So keep trusting in him. That's going to be seen in a grateful heart, in a grateful spirit. And this, it says, let us. We do this together. 
We encourage one another. We are a community of praise. God wants his house to be called a house of prayer for all people. A house of praise and prayer and worship and honor and exaltation. This is what our community is about. This is what we are as families. So I want you to ask yourselves, in your home, make note, don't, you know, don't cheat off of somebody else's paper, what in your home, in your family, would you say your house is a house of prayer? Would you say your house is a house of praise and thanksgiving? Is there continual offerings going up from us together? If not, just write it down. It's an area for prayer to ask the Lord to help your family to grow in this area. This is something that we have as a goal in our families, in our relationships, in our homes, in our hearts. We grow in this more and more and more. If you're going to sit there and say, oh, that, that's just idealistic garbage. You keep thinking those thoughts and you're just going to reinforce your problems. That's all that's going on. When you give yourself over to that kind of stinking thinking, it's, oh, come on, let's get back into the real world. I live in the real world outside the camp. It's just I don't leave home without him. I bring him with me. He is with me. Is he with you? He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. How can you ignore him, therefore? And so we grow still more in the love of God. We grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. These are things we grow into as individuals, as families, as a community. A congregation is just a bunch of families that come together on Saturday morning. Each family has to be growing for our community to be growing in the Lord. You say, well, what, what am I going to do with my kids? You're going to teach them these things. That is your job as a parent. Your job is to teach them and to model it. You say, well, I'm not very good at it. Get better at it. You obviously haven't come through my premarital counseling where we tell you, you've got to be ready to pray all the time. That's what marriage is about. Marriage is ministry. And so you family life the same way. And so our sacrifice of praise commemorates his sacrifice for our pardon. Uh, and so you're deceiving yourself. You may want to write that down if you're living in self-deception. Are you deceiving yourself that you think you're trusting in his gracious sacrifice without gratefully praising him for it? You're just self-deceived. If you're trusting in the sacrifice, you are going, it is grace to you, the grace in which we stand. If you're trusting in that grace, it's going to be seen. It's going to be made evident uh, as your heart praises him. You say, I just don't feel it. It's intentional. Listen, faith is intentional. Faith is because you say, I will believe God. I know my flesh wants to lie right now. But I will believe God that no lie is of the truth. I will believe God and his way of living. I will praise him because he's God. Because he's God. I will praise him. It's an intentional choice that we make. Uh, it's not, you say, well, I'm waiting for good things to happen. You will be backsliding. That's what comes naturally. Press on to the mark of a high calling by faith. And so we want to understand what he's going on. He says, through Yeshua, remember? Uh, and now he's going to reiterate, because he says, that is. He sort of, he's saying, let me put this in other words. Let me make it a little bit more clearer for you, if I haven't been clear enough yet. He's, you say, but why is he making such a big deal about it? Your whole eternity is going to be doing this. Get ready, start practicing. Be prepared. Don't be shocked by heaven. We're going to be praising him. You don't want to be the only one in heaven that doesn't know what to do, do you? And so he's going to help it be you know, crystal clear, uh, putting it into a way we can understand it. That's why he goes on to say here about this, that praise is going to be consequential. It's, it's a consequential sacrifice uh, from our faith. You say, well, what do you mean? You'll notice he talks about the fruit of lips. We had this in our call to worship from Hosea chapter 14. Uh, Hosea 14 reiterated the very same truth we're seeing here. Uh, praise, as a kind, praise is a result. Like the fruit of the Spirit is a result of the Spirit. Fruit is a result. Fruit is a byproduct. Fruit is a consequence. The root of the Spirit is looking unto Yeshua. That is faith. So your heart of faith, 
That's where the root is, trusting in Yeshua, believing on him. The result, the fruit of that, the fruit of the lips. And you'll notice what it said in Hosea. Take a look at that verse again. Take words with you and return to Lord Satan. Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. Listen, same truth. If he has received you graciously, that will be seen in the fruit of your lips. Do you see what he's saying there? If you have been received graciously, that will be seen in the fruit of your lips, in the words you say, in what you're talking about. The heart overflows into speech. And so, uh, as we continue on, we want to understand what he says here. The fruit of lips confessing his name. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, a present participle there. Uh, confessing his name. You say, well, I, I don't understand. Uh, when we talk about confessing, it's one of my favorite words. Those going through discipleship classes on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock, uh, you're dealing with this word that's used here, homologeo. Uh, it has to do with agreement, agreeing with, agree, same word, it means in the, in the original. Uh, same word, confessing uh, the fruit of this when you confess Yeshua is Lord. You sincerely agree with God about Yeshua, and you sincerely give praise to God for Yeshua. Uh, but it's, it can be used otherwise. There's a lot of people who can say things with their lips they don't mean in their heart. You see, that's, you, can be a, you can be a hypocrite. You say, what do you mean? Take a look how the word's used. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess, that's the same word, to confess. They confess Yeshua. They profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. And so there's a hypocrisy that takes place. And so you want to make sure that the root of the Spirit is faith and that the overflow of that, the fruit of it, the byproduct of that, is going to be praise unto God, confessing Him. And so, how does it all start? We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I memorized it in another version. But in any case, confess. We agree with God about our sins. What's that mean? Listen, sin is not merely sin because it offends you. Sin is not sin because it upsets you. Sin is not sin because it undermined your, your ability to get things done or because you were disrespected or you weren't appreciated. Sin is not sin because of its impact on your life. Sin is sin because it offends God and therefore the Word of God, the Bible, tells us what sin is. And therefore, we admit they are sins. We agree with God that they are sins because his word shows us as much. As you mature in the Lord, you'll be offended by the things that offend God. The very things that perhaps you, you actually put a lot of money into or had a lot of fun doing, all those thin, things that perhaps were your lost weekends and all the crazy stuff like that, after a while, as you mature, you'll be offended by the very things that offend him as you walk closely with our God. And so we want to understand we agree with the Bible, it's sinful and wrong. And then we have the cleansing that comes in the atonement through our Messiah. And we confess with your mouth, Yeshua is Lord. We agree with God about him and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. When you will say, yes, Yeshua is Lord, he died for my sins, was raised bodily from the dead guarantee you by your faith you have that receipt uh, that you are now you are now a child of God by faith in Yeshua and so now as we move along to the other side of the coin here because these Hebrews who was being written to they were getting all caught up and stuff distracted oh I can't possibly I'm too upset to read my Bible I'm too upset to pray oh man I'm under such stress I couldn't possibly share Messiah with one person oh my goodness I couldn't think of doing that I'm too exhausted I, well they 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 uh, that's how they're being encouraged here that that is not going to be the case their life is to be lived differently and so he says in verse 16, not only about our grateful sacrifice, but also our gracious sacrifices for others. Do not forget about doing good and sharing with such sacrifice. God is well pleased. Don't forget. See, this is what happens if you're not habituated to praise. If you're not habituated by faith. You say, what do you mean habituated? Yeah, see, some of us may be in a bondage to all kinds of habits. 
You may have a chemical dependency, or you may be addicted to internet porn, or you may be addicted to using just bad language. You know, you can't help, oh, I'm always talking like that. <laughs> you may be not even noticing it. You want to understand that God sets you free from that, and now you develop good habits in your mind, praising him in your heart. Not only the words of your lips, but the meditations of your heart would be pleasing to him. These are the good habits. And so we want to understand not to forget. Because some of us, you know, you get your head in the clouds. You can be so heavenly minded, no earthly good. But if you're actually heavenly minded with wisdom, you would be some earthly good. Without, being, without having the things of God on your mind, you're not going to do much good for anyone down here at all. And so we want to understand the issue that along with worshiping, the other side of the same coin of grace is going to be what we might say practical living, but there's nothing more practical than praising God, but, but also helping others. It has to be being others-oriented in our life. Uh, our stewardship in what we do with our time, talent, and treasure. You say, well, what, what do you mean? We have a sacrifice of stewardship towards others. You say, well, you mean like by disposable income? Uh, sure, we can start with that, uh, but we're talking about you as a person, your purpose here in this world to represent God and to use of your time and your talent and your treasure for the things that are pleasing to the Lord. Uh, when we talk about it uh, from a certain angle, we talk about tzedakah, uh, the issue of, of, of doing just uh, justice and righteousness, uh, good deeds are things we do that reflect the righteousness of God. Uh, you know, he became sin offering in our place that we might become the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And so we have this, this, he put righteousness into our account to spend. If I put, uh, how many people, could, I, I don't want to demean you or anything, how many of you can use an extra billion? A million won't do you any good anymore, I, I know that. But an extra billion probably would, how many of you, come on, raise your hand, you know, I'll take it. Okay, I put a billion in your account, but you decide not to use it. You'd say, oh, I don't know, I feel, I'm so used to being poor, why break those habits at this stage of my life? Well, you may have some bad habits of unrighteousness. God, through the Messiah, has put righteousness into your account for you to spend and be spent by faith in him. And so that's what we do as we live for the Lord. We are a bunch of do-gooders. We do all the good we can as much as we can. I want you to make a list for yourself. You say, I'm a visitor here. I don't make lists. Well, fit in just by pretending to make a list then. Uh, make a list for things that you can be doing uh, with your heart, with your life, with your, with your everything. It says there, Ephesians 4, 28, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, perform with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. And so as you're working, you're doing that so you can help others. Uh, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Are you writing down some things to grow in? Here's some more. Depart from evil and do good. You can't both be involved in evil and do good. You know, you say, well, well doesn't it sort of balance it out? Uh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> you don't get the balancing thing at all. It's, it's like the story uh, of the kids who were watching films that were bad for them, you know, R-rated films and things that uh, R is usually for wretched or something, you know. But the idea is that they're watching these films and the dad walked in, oh, dad, you're home early, yikes, you know. Uh, that's okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to want to, uh, you know, make you some brownies so you can watch your movie. Make me some brownies, dad, so I can watch the movie? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some brownies. That will be great, Dad. I'm going to put just a little dog poo in it. What? Just a little. You're going to put what in? Dog dung. In the brownies, Dad? Yeah, in the brownies. It'll be mixed in. They won't even notice it. Dad, no, don't do that. 
it, it probably won't even be in the piece you have. You don't even, and besides, I'll put enough sugar, you won't even notice it. No, I don't want any. Well, don't you understand that movie that you're watching has just a little dog dung in it, and you think you can do just okay. You don't understand the corruption it's bringing into your soul. You can't do evil and do good at the same time. You have to understand how life is. Seek peace and pursue it. Learn to do good. This is something you learn. It's a discipleship issue. As a disciple, you learn to do good. Don't expect to be good at it real fast. But we learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. We are to speak truth to the powerful. Though we might have the right to speak the truth to the powerless. Learn. Learn to do good if you're going to grow in the Messiah. I say to you here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. What? Isn't this different than the terrorists? They look for any excuse to be blowing up children. We're taught to love our enemies and do good for our enemies. Can you see the difference between biblical faith and what the world is offering these poor people around the world? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Who said such a silly thing? Yeshua the Messiah. He is the truth. You know Yeshua of, of Nazareth. You know of Yeshua of Nazareth, how God anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went about doing good. Have you been anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power? That's going to be seen. You're going about doing good in healing all those the enemy has been oppressing. For God was with him. This is Yeshua and this is us, therefore. For if he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, even through you, he is still going to be doing the same good. He's going to be caring for the weak and the helpless and the hurting. He's going to be reaching out. Uh, you say, well, is that going to be, do you saying this, so I'll give a gift for a trip? Sure I am. And I'll say it every week for somebody else or whatever else. Above your normal tithes and offerings, though, you know. But still, we're to be doing all that we can for the whomsoever we can reach out to with the love of God. And so the whole idea is sharing. You say, okay, you hit that already. No, I missed it. I didn't hit it at all. The word there, koinia, uh, the Hebrew word, chavara, uh, we have a, a chavara, our homes, uh, this unity, this fellowship, have fellowship, association, community, communion, participation. Sometimes it's translated sharing or contribution even. Uh, it has to do with a relationship uh, characterized by partake, partaking in common fellowship. Uh, notice how it's used in Romans 15. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution, there's the word, for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they are pleased to do so, and they were indebted to them. Indebted? For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual thing, shared, the same word. So it's a spiritual as well as financial or material kind of thing. You say, I don't understand. It's a unity we have in the Lord, and that's that unity we talk about. Whether it's spending time with people, giving of your talent or your treasure or whatever you have, you're actually showing that you have fellowship with them and therefore indebted to minister uh, material matters as well. And so we sacrifice for fellowship with others. And so uh, you say, well, maybe I'll write a check. Be careful here. Don't write a check to remove your responsibility. Write a check because you're responsible. She, Eden, and others, uh, when you go to Malawi, David, uh, you're going to express our heart. You're not going apart from that. You are our arm reaching out, just as Eden will be doing, and all the others that we're supporting and reaching out. Tomorrow, when Pat and the teams are there at South Park, they're not going as anything but representative of who we are. And so we want to understand that when you write a check, you're investing your heart. Uh, you're saying, I am with you uh, where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. And so we're expressing our time, talent, and treasure. All of that is in our fellowship that we do in the Lord in all of these matters. And I want, for those who love studying original language, let me just note for you what it says, God is well pleased. That phrase is used in the Hebrew 
for walking with God. The same, the rabbis who translated the Hebrew text into Greek, when they got to walking with God, they used the phrase, God is well pleased, well pleasing to God. You say, why they do that? Because that's the intent of it. In other words, you are walking with God when you do those things pleasing to him. When you do those things pleasing to him, you're walking with God. You're in fellowship with him now and forever. And therefore, when it says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to walk with God. This is the relationship we have with God. He made us in his own image that we might actually have a relationship with him and one another. And what Yeshua has done by his death and resurrection has brought us into this fellowship with the living God that we express and represent his love to others. God never intended us to do life alone. We're in this together to show his love, his graciousness, his goodness as we praise him forever and ever. That's why we're faithful in fellowship as we're reaching out, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. No, more and more, growing together in the great things of God. As we go to the Lord in prayer, here's some pointers, final pointers for you. Because he's the same outside the camp, he never changes. Through faith, uh, of, in, through faith his grace proves ever sufficient when you're grateful in worship when you're helpful in your stewardship, and when you're faithful in fellowship. When you're faithful, helpful, grateful, because of the grace of God that's been given to you that you live out by faith. You are walking with God by the very sacrifice that you might have fellowship with him now and forever. Let's pray. Let's bow our hearts before God. If you're here and you say, wow, I, I'm, I'm nowhere around that part of the world, well, come on in. Go outside the camp by grace. You say, I'm in this bondage. God will set you free right now by his grace in the Messiah. He will set you free. Just trust in who he is, what he has done. You have to do anything, he will save you. And that you might now be an instrument representing him through that same grace, through gratitude and graciousness to others. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to grow still more in the grace of God and the love of God and the kindness of God, that your name may be exalted in our life, in our fellowship, in our homes, in our relationships. Add your blessing that we might be known as praisers of God, that we might be a congregation that shows the very life of God in our midst as we honor his name. For it's in his name we give praise and adoration. May he be enthroned in the praises of his people. For it's in Jewish name we pray. Amen.